I'm Bradley Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And on behalf of everybody here at PNP, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, you are about to hear a truly incredible story, one that is, to be honest, virtually impossible for most, if not all of us, to imagine. Uh, how can we conceive of what it's like to be age 29 and arrested, accused of murders and robberies that we didn't commit, convicted of two killings, sentenced to death by execution, and then spend 30 years on death row in a small cell witnessing more than 50 other inmates go to their executions in a nearby chamber. That is what happened to Ray Hinton, who grew up poor and black in rural Alabama and became a victim of a criminal justice system that still is at times grossly unjust, especially to those who lack the means to mount an effective defense. Ray eventually had some good fortune. He came to the attention of Brian Stevenson, the attorney and social justice activist and best-selling author of Just Mercy, who took up Ray's case. Three years ago, after a very lengthy legal battle, Ray finally was able to walk free. He has spent much time since speaking to church groups, college audiences, journalists, whomever is interested about what he experienced, about endurance and not giving up, about justice for all and the need for prison reform, uh, and about the power of faith and yes, forgiveness. And he's written a book, The Sun Does Shine, about how, as he says in the subtitle, he found life and freedom on death row. Now, before I turn things over to Ray, I, I want to read a few sentences of what Brian Stevenson has to say in a foreword to the book. It will give you a sense of the profound impact that Ray and his story uh, had on those who got to know him in prison and those like Brian who represented him. I've visited countless prisons and jails to see hundreds of clients during the course of my career. I'm usually ignored or merely tolerated by correctional staff during these visits. There have been times when I have been harassed or challenged by prison staff who seem to resent incarcerated people getting legal visits. Visiting Ray Hinton was unlike any other legal visit for me. Never have more guards, correctional staff, and prison workers pulled me aside to offer assistance or question me about how they could help uh, than during the many years I have worked with Ray. I have never experienced anything like it. Uh, and Brian goes on further to say, I have represented scores of condemned prisoners during my 30 years of law practice. Many of my clients were innocent people, wrongly convicted or condemned. However, no one I have represented has inspired me more than Anthony Ray Hinton, and I believe his compelling and unique story will similarly inspire our nation and readers all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ray Hinton. Thank you for that long introduction. What he forgot to tell you, that this book is the second best book that ever been written. <laughs> I promise you that. And I brought a lawyer here tonight, and at least she came with me, and she worked for EJI. And if you buy this book, and if you don't enjoy and agree with me that this being the second best book that ever been written, I'll give you her number later and she will <laughs> refund your, your money. But 30 years ago, the state of Alabama came and kidnapped me. 30 years ago, I would love to look you in the eye tonight and tell you that the state of Alabama made an honest mistake. I would like to tell you tonight that race had nothing to do with me spending 30 years of pure hell 
in a five by seven. But the state of Alabama didn't make an honest mistake. The state of Alabama knew that I was not the person that had committed the crime. In fact, one of the detectives is quoted as saying, we didn't get the right one, but at least we got one off the streets. And I spent 30 years of pure hell on a five by seven. All because I was born black and poor. Whether you want to accept it or not, we have two sets of laws in this country. For those of you who've been blessed with money, you can buy justice. For those of us who was born poor, we are the one that the prosecutors, the police, picks up every day and send you to prison and as well as death. But this happened one day on a hot day in Alabama. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to Alabama, but I'm going to give you a free tip tonight. If you haven't been to Alabama in July, take my word, do not go. <laughs> it is far too hot in Alabama in July. But my mother had made some lemonade, and it was beyond hot. I goes inside, and I get me a glass of lemonade. And my mother looked at me as I was pouring this lemonade, and she asked me, was I going to revival tonight? And I said, yes, ma'am. For in the South, we say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, out of pure respect. And I got this lemonade and went outside, and 15 minutes later, I brought the glass back inside, and there my mother was again in the kitchen. She said, what time revival start tonight? And I said, 7 o'clock, ma'am. She said, well, you got time to go out there and cut that grass. Being the baby of the family, I thought I would give my mother this baby look, and she would change her mind. And I looked at her, and I said, Mama, I promise you, I will cut that grass tomorrow. My mother looked at me, and she said, I'm trying my best to see how you got. You'll cut the grass tomorrow out of me telling you to go cut the grass. And she gave me that look that only she could give me, and I knew exactly what it meant. And finally she said, boy, you better get out there and cut the grass. I cut this grass, and about 25 minutes into cutting the grass, I, I just happened to look up, and there stood two white gentlemen that I'd never seen before. I cut the lawnmower off, and I said, can I help you? One of them replied, we're looking for Anthony Ray Hinton. I said, that would be me. How can I help you? Then they identified themselves as two detectives from the Birmingham Police Department. I said, again, how can I help you? They said, we have a warrant for your arrest. And I said, for what? They said, we'll explain that to you later, but right now we want you to put your hands behind your back. I complied. I put my hands behind my back, and they put the handcuff on me. They was proceeding to put me in the squad car, but I said, hold up, at least allow me the opportunity to go inside and tell my mother I'm being arrested for something. We argued for a moment or two. One of the detectives said, we can't let you go back inside. Finally, after arguing for a minute or two, the other detective said, let him go in and tell his mother. I goes inside and I just show my mother the handcuff. And like any good mother, she just began to scream and holler, what are those handcuffs doing on my baby? The detective said, take him and put him in the car and let, while I stand here and talk to his mother. A few minutes later, he come outside and we proceeded to go to the county jail. The detective turned around and he said, Anthony, do you own a pistol? I said, no. He said, do your mother own a pistol? And I said, yes. Told him what kind it was. They dropped me off at a substation and turned around and went back and talked to my mother and she gave them the pistol. And every day, somebody that is familiar with my case would ask me, why did you tell the police about a gun that they had no knowledge of? And I said, ever since I can remember, my mother always told me, if you haven't done anything, you have no reason to lie. If you haven't done anything, why are you running? always tell the truth. And that day, I told the truth. As we proceeded to go a little farther, the detective said, Anthony, are you sure 
that you don't own a pistol. And I said, yes, that's the only pistol that's in the house. It's that 38. We drove a little farther, and I asked the detective at least 50 times, why am I being arrested? The detective never would respond. And finally, as they drove a little farther, I asked again, detective, why are y'all arresting me? This scene to set the detective off, and he turned around, and he looked at me. He said, you want to know why we're arresting you? I said, yes. He said, we're going to charge you with first-degree robbery, first-degree kidnapping, first-degree attempted murder. I said, I haven't done any of that. The detective looked at me and he said, let me make something clear to you right now. I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it, but I'm going to make sure you found guilty of it. And I said, for a crime that I didn't commit, he said, you must have a hidden problem. I just told you I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it. And as they drove a little further, he turned around and he said, by the way, there's five things that are going to convict you. He said, would you like to know what they are? And I said, yes. He said, number one, you're black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him, whether you shot him or not. He said, believe me, I don't care. Number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, more than likely, you're going to have an all-white jury. And he said, do you know what that spell? And he repeated the word conviction. Conviction, 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 conviction. And as I got to the jail, they put me in this holding cell for about two and a half hours, and finally this detective came back in. And I said, Detective, what date and what time did this crime take place? He went through his file, and he looked, and he told me the date and the time. And I said, Detective, if you're telling the truth, thank God I was at work that particular day and that particular time. I said, here's my supervisor number. Here's the address you can go out there. Left and about four and a half hours later, he came back and he said, we have good news and bad news. The good news is we're no longer going to charge you with first degree robbery, first degree kidnap, first degree attempted murder. He said, we have decided that we're going to charge you with two counts of first degree capital murder. I said, but I haven't killed anyone. He said, you really need to have that hearing problem checked. Didn't I tell you on the way here I didn't care one way or another? It still is in effect for these charges. He said, if nothing else, I'm going to make sure that you found guilty. As I sit there and talk to this detective, the detective looked at me and he said, by the way, I truly believe that you didn't do it. He said, but y'all is always taking up from one another Take this rap for your homeboy. And with tears coming down my eyes, I said, Detective, I don't have a homeboy in this world that I would ever take a rap for like this. I goes to jail, goes before the judge. The judge read me off my charges and asks me, do I have an attorney? I tell him no. He looks back in his courtroom and he called his attorney up front Without even asking me my name, the attorney looked at me and he said, I did not go to law school to do pro bono work. The lawyer said, they don't pay me enough. I'm only going to make $1,000. I eat $1,000 for breakfast. And as I looked at the lawyer, I said, would it make a difference to you if I told you that I was innocent? The lawyer looked at me and he said, the problem with that statement is all of y'all, y'all always doing something and then saying you didn't do it. This is the lawyer that I had to depend on to try and prove my innocence on two counts of capital murder. I go to trial and they find me guilty of two counts of capital murder. The judge proudly stood up that day and said, Anthony Ray Hinton, you have been found guilty on two counts of capital murder. It is the order of this court that we sentence you to death. And that judge had the audacity to say, may God have mercy on your soul. The prosecution ran out that day and told the media that the state of Alabama got the worst killer that ever walked the streets off the streets that day. 
but only it wasn't true. On December 17, 1986, they transported me to Holman Correctional Facility. Once arriving there for the next three years, I didn't say another word to a human being. I went in this dark place. I was mad with everybody. I was more angry with God than anybody. I kept believing in what my mother had told me as a boy, that God can do everything but fail. And as I sit there in silence, I begin to ask, where is you now, God? How is it that you can allow this to happen to me? Going into the fourth year, I woke up to the sound of a grown man crying, a man that I had lived by for three years and never asked him his name or where he was from. I wasn't there to get to know anyone. I wasn't there to befriend anyone. All I know that I was there for something that I didn't do, and the state of Alabama knew that I didn't do it. But at an early age, my mother had taught me compassion. She said, no matter what one does in life, he or she still deserve compassion. And through this brick wall, I hollered through this man and I asked him, was something wrong? Took this man a while to reply, but later he said, I just got worried that my mother passed. I told him how sorry I was to hear that, and I told him that if anyone was going to argue his case, it would be his mother. And I told him a little corny joke, and we both kind of laughed, and I laid back down. I woke up again about 6 a.m., and I realized that my voice was back. My sense of humor was back. All of my life, I tell people I was born with two things, if nothing else, in this world. I was born to a mother who loved it me unconditional. And I always have had a sense of humor. I don't care how young you are, how old you are, how beautiful you are. If I'm just happen to be there and you walking and you kind of fall, I'll be the first one to run and help you up, ask you, are you okay? But the moment you say I'm fine, I'm going to laugh at you for falling. <laughs> oh, I'm going to do that. I think laughter is good for the soul. And so that morning, the state of Alabama was in the process of executing four men, and I never will forget. I called this guard up to my cell, and I said, Your officer, is there anything you can give me for this smell? He looked at me, and he said, There's nothing I can give you. He said, But if there's a consolation, you'll get used to smelling the human flesh being burned. He looked at me and he said, and by the way, one day somebody will smell your flesh burn. And it was at that moment when he told me that I decided that since I couldn't escape physically, I would escape mentally. As I sit on this bunk that I had been too small for me, I decided that I needed to escape. And I looked at my body and I said, body, the mind need to leave in order to survive. And it was as though my body looked up at me and said, do you promise to come back? And I said, of course I'm coming back. I got to check on this case. And the moment my body gave me permission to leave, off I went. Of all the places in the world to travel in your mind, I wanted to go see Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> now, please, later on, do not come up to me and ask me why a 29-year-old black male want to see Queen Elizabeth. I don't know. But that's who I wanted to see. And in my mind, I went to the palace, told the guard that I was there to see the queen. The queen told him to show me in. In my mind, I sit down and we talked about Prince Charles, Prince William, Prince Harris, and of course the tragedy of Prince Di. After about 45 minutes of talking, the queen realized that she hadn't offered me anything to drink. And finally, the queen looked at me and she said, Mr. Hitton, would you like some tea? And I told the queen I would love some tea. Once I realized that I could go anywhere in my mind, I decided that I would do something that as a little boy I said I would never do and that I would never get married. But I decided that I would marry and I married the beautiful and talented actress, Halle Berry. <laughs> Halle Berry and I stayed married in this mind for 15 long years beautiful years. 
And if ever there was a perfect wife, she was the perfect wife. <laughs> Halle Berry was in my mind, always said, yes, dear, and whatever you want, dear. And what I loved it the most, she didn't spend no money. <laughs> and then the prison did something that it rarely do for death row inmate. They showed us a movie, and the movie was Speed. And there, for the first time, I lay eyes on Sandra Bullock. In my mind, I could see Halle Berry sitting beside me, and I'm looking at Halle, and I'm looking at Sandra Book. I'm looking at Halle, and I'm looking at Sandra Book. It was as though I was looking at a tennis match. I knew that I, in my mind, I had to tell Halle some bad news. <laughs> I watched this woman drive this big old bus, and I got to thinking, imagine what she could do with a getaway car. And so I told Halle that I was going to divorce her and marry Sandra Bullock. And by that time, the guard was standing there and he was calling me and he said, Anthony, I've been calling you for 10 minutes. He said, where are you? I said, I was gone, what is it? He tell me I have a legal visit. I said, the state of Alabama do not appoint you a legal visit during post-conviction. He said, well, Anthony, somebody's out there pretending to be a lawyer. Go out there and see who it is. I goes out there and the lawyer introduced himself to me and he tells me, that he is from Boston. I asked him who sent him. He told me a man by the name of Brian Stevenson. I said, who is Brian Stevenson? He told me about Brian Stevenson and Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. He tells me about the work they do, and he tells me how good this Brian Stevenson is. I said, I don't know Brian Stevenson, but he can't be that good. He said, why you say that? I said, well, Brian Stevenson have already made one fundamental mistake. I said, did you not say you were from Boston? He said, yes. I said, well, had this great Mr. Brian Stevenson would have checked with me first, he would have known that I am a beloved Yankee fan. <laughs> and there's no way a Yankee fan and a Boston fan could ever do anything together. I said, but for your sake, I'm willing to put my personal feeling aside and let you work on my case. And for the next three years, he worked on my case, and he would come back and tell me, what he was trying to do. Going into the fourth year, he told me he was trying to get me a life without parole. I said, you trying to get me a life without parole? He said, yes. I said, life without parole is for guilty people, not innocent people. I said, I would prefer to die than to stand up and lie like I did something when I didn't do it. I said, believe me, all of us at some point in some time must die. I said, I'm not ready to die, and I definitely don't want to die for something that I didn't do. I said, but if the state of Alabama is hell-bent on executing me for a crime they know I didn't commit, so be it. I said, but I cannot stand up and say I did something when I didn't. I said, I need a lawyer that believes in me, and I need a lawyer that is willing to go to jail for me if necessary. I said, you may not understand what I'm about to tell you. I said, but at the age of 12, I never will forget it. My mother told me these words. She said, if you man enough to bend down and pick up a rock, and if you man enough to throw that rock, you should be man enough to say you throw that rock. I said, this is one rock I didn't throw. Therefore, I could never say that I throw this rock when I didn't. And I looked at this lawyer and I said, today, I have no choice but to fire you. I said, I appreciate everything you did, but I need a lawyer that believed in me. And as I was going toward the back, something in my mind said, you got to be the dumbest person in the world. You fired the only lawyer that you had, and just as that thought entered my mind, another thought said, you did the right thing. Always stand up for what you believe in. Always stand up for principle. As I get closer to my cell, the guard is watching TV, and there is Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson was talking about why we don't need a death penalty in this country. And as I listened at this man, for whatever reason, I knew this is the man that I needed to represent me. Later that night, I wrote him a letter and thanked him for sending this lawyer, and I asked him, would he consider becoming my lawyer? And I said, but before you say yes or no, read my transcript. And if you find one thing in my transcript that point to my guilt, do not worry about becoming my lawyer. Do not send me a lawyer. 
I am willing to die for something that I didn't do. Three months later, I get a reply that he would read my transcript. Five months later, I get a letter that he would be coming to see me. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot explain it, but the moment I shook this man's hand, I knew that God had sent me his best. And as we sit there and talked about our childhood, we finally got off into the case. I said, Mr. Stevenson, the state of Alabama is saying that the gun they got from my mom is the murder weapon. I said, if no two guns is alike, I know that they are telling a lie. I said, Mr. Stevenson, I know how you lawyers are. You don't want no one telling you how to do your job, but I need a favor from you. I need you to hire a ballistic expert. I said, but Mr. Stevenson, this just cannot be any expert. I said, Mr. Stevenson, I need this expert to be a white male. I need him to be from the South. I said, because in the South, they only recognize their own. I don't care how good a white female could have been. She could have been the best in the country, but her word is no good on that witness stand in the South. And I said, Mr. Stevenson, you know, it cannot be a person of color. It have to be a white Southern male. And I need him to believe in the death penalty. I need him to be the best of the best. But above all of that, I just need him to tell the truth. Mr. Stevenson left that day and told me he would try and find that expert. About three to four months later, I called him and he told me he found two ex three experts, two from Texas and one from Virginia. He told me that the expert was the best of the best. He said, but I need to inform you of something. These three experts testify 98% of the time for the prosecution. They never have testified for the defense. He said, are you sure these are the experts that you want? I said, yes. I said, Mr. Stevenson, did you remember to ask them, would they just tell the truth? He said, they said they would do exactly and say what the evidence showed. I said, if you can, then how these three experts? They came to Alabama on three separate occasions. They did the finding. They even tried to make the gun match, and it still wouldn't match. We take this new evidence before the attorney general, who was Bill Pry at the time, asked him to re-examine the evidence, and he said it would be a waste of the taxpayer money to re-examine the bullets, and it would be a waste of his time to take one hour to re-examine those bullets. And for not doing his job, George W. Bush appointed him to a lifetime federal judgeship. We went before another attorney general by the name of Troy King, and he too refused to take one out. He lost in the next election. We go to a man by the name of Luther Strange. He too refused to take one hour, and his reward was he got promoted and took Jeff Sessions' seat. I spent another 16 years in that hell because my life didn't matter. And one day, Mr. Stevenson came to me and he said, Ray, the state of Alabama refused to do what is right. We got to take your case to the United States Supreme Court. He said, but I need to tell you, if the United States Supreme Court rule against you, more than likely within two years, the state of Alabama will execute you. I said, Mr. Stevenson, take my case to the court. Two years after filing to the United States Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Justice did something they have never done in the history of the courts. All nine justices ruled in my favor. And I do stay up at night. I still can't believe Clarence Thomas ruled in my favor. <laughs> but he did. He did that. But all nine justice ruled in my favor, and they sent my case back 
to Alabama. We go before the judge. The state of Alabama stands up and say, Your Honor, it is with deep sadness that we inform this court that we have lost the gun in question. The judge give him ample time to find it. She said another date, we go before him, they stands up and say, Your Honor, it is with deep pleasure that we inform this court we found the gun. But it is only with sadness that we inform this court that we have lost the bullets that goes to the gun. All of this time I'm sitting in prison and they playing a game. And while we were thinking they were looking for the bullets, the prosecution called one of his own experts that had testified 30 years ago to come back and re-examine the bullets. He comes back and he re-examined the bullets and he said, I don't see what I saw 30 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, he saw exactly what he saw 30 years ago. The bullets didn't match 30 years ago and it wasn't going to match 30 years later. The state of Alabama had every intention on executing an innocent man, but they ran against two problems. Number one, they didn't know that I had a personal relationship with God. Number two, they didn't know God was going to send me EJI and Brian Stevens. And once they came up against that, only then did they notify the judge that they was dropping all charges against me. The state of Alabama was seeking the death penalty. The state of Alabama kept me away from the woman that I love more than anything, my mother. My mother passed in 2002. The state of Alabama was seeking the highest justice that they could seek. The state of Alabama was seeking my life. And today, I have to come to Washington, D.C. And I have to ask you, where's my justice? Who do I seek justice from? The state of Alabama to this day haven't even had the decency to say that they saw her. 30 years of my life. For what? Because I was born black. 30 years of pure hell. 54 men and one woman walked past me on their way to the death chamber. Men and one woman. And then I had to smell their flesh burning because my cell was 30 feet away from the death chair. In this book, I write about hope. I write about what death row taught me, that either you love or you hate. Either you help or you do harm. None of us know the exact second our life will change forever. I often question, did my life change the day that I was arrested? Or did my life change even before then? But how is it that we have a system that allows innocent men and women to go not just to prison but to death? They don't stay overnight. They stay for decades. I was the 152nd person that have been exonerated. How many men and women need to be exonerated before you as a people say enough is enough? I am one who believes that what affect me today could very well affect you tomorrow in some way. In this book, I only talks about love because my mother showed me love. My mother was one of the most loving people I ever know. In this book, I talk about how 
I took my life and began to live. In this book, I put the justice system on trial and show you that we don't have a perfect justice system the way that you might think we have. Oh, yes, she's blind. She would have you to believe she's blind because she have this mask over her eyes. But I'm here tonight to tell you that she can see. She know what race you are. She know what gender you are. She know what college you went to. She know where you live. <laughs> See, when she put all of that together, it is already determined before you even get in her courtroom whether you're going to be found guilty or not guilty. My great friend, Mr. Brian Stevenson, say that in this country, we treat a rich and guilty man better than we treat an innocent poor man. That is the system that we have. This is the system that I found myself in. But in this book, if nothing else, you would read about a story about a man that was a KKK member, a young man that had been taught to hate all his life. And when he went out and did something that most of us perhaps could never see, he went out and he hung a young 19-year-old black male. He did it at the order of his father. His father was the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. And everybody that have read this book asked me, how could you befriend a Klansman? I often tell people, first, let's dissect this Klansman. Take the three K's away from his name, and he is Henry Francis Hayes. Let's look at Henry Francis Hayes. From the time he was conceived, his daddy taught him to hate. And when he came out of his mother's womb, he began to teach him even how to hate even more. And as a little boy, he continued to teach him how to hate. And I question, where was child protective service when this young man was being taught to hate? Why was this village that we all say it take a village to raise a child? Why was this village when this young man was being taught to hate? Well, see, my mother taught me to love. My mother said no matter what one does, he or she still deserves compassion. And in my walk mind, I said if his father can teach him how to hate, why don't I try to teach him how to love? I am so proud to call Henry Francis Hayes my friend because on the night they executed him, Henry Francis Hayes was quoted as saying, when they asked him did he have any last word, he said, all of my life, my father, my mother, my community taught me how to hate. It wasn't until I came to death row, the very people that they taught me how to hate are the ones that taught me how to love. And tonight, I leave this earth knowing what real love feel like. To me, we should all learn not to judge. We should all learn how to forgive. It wasn't until I decided that I would pick my Bible back up and read it after three years of dust. I came across a scripture that said Mark 11 and 24 what things whatever you desire when you pray, believe in them and you shall have them. Not one time in 30 years did I ask God to free me. For if I asked God to free me, I thought that would be so selfish of me. God could have freed me if I asked him to free me in death. And I didn't want to go that way. I didn't want freedom that way. And so what I did was I prayed and asked God to allow the truth to come out. And when the truth came out, I walked out with the truth. Almost 33 years later, not a soul in the state of Alabama of importance have emailed, texted me, called me, written me a letter, anything, and said, Mr. Hinton, we're sorry. But I would refuse to let Death Row defined who I was. 
I refuse to let six racist white men define who I was. Tonight, I ask you these questions. What would you do if they came for you? What would you do? If they came and charged you for a crime that you didn't commit, what would you do if you took a polygraph test but no one believed you? What would you do if you didn't have the money to hire a defense? What would you do if the system saw you for the color of your skin than the merit of the case? What would you do if you was found and sentenced to death? What would you do? if you had to spend the rest of your life living in a cell the size of your bathroom, what would you do if you spent your whole life waiting to die? How would you survive? What would you do? And what would you do after 30 years they finally set you free? Who would you be? But more important, what would you be? This book, you need three things when you read this book. You need a box of Kleenex, some Oreos cookies, <laughs> and some good cold milk. Because I promise you, this book will blow your mind. This book will hold no bars. This book will make you laugh. This book will make you cry. This book will make you question what you truly believe in. In the back of this book, I ask you, can you look at the names and tell who is innocent and who is guilty? Because my name was on this list at one time, and I knew that I was innocent. And every 10 names when you read this book say innocent. We can do better in this country. We owe it to our children and children to make this justice system better. We owe it to our grandkids to make sure that they come up in a system that is fair. If everything, any system, we need the justice system to truly be colorblind, genderblind. We need a justice system that works for all of us and not a few of us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. If anyone have a question, I don't charge but $10 per question. <laughs> and so, ask away. Mr. Hinton, thank you very much for being here today, and thank you, and thank you very much for your words. Um, I'm finding reading the book to be truly meaningful. I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area, and one thing that I was wondering... Um, after I began reading the book is, um, is there anything in particular that you would like young people to learn from your story? It is. Uh, I think we live in a world where young people have not been taught love, true love. I don't need to be related to you to love you. As a human being, we should learn to love one another. I think young people need to learn how to forgive one another. All of us need to learn how to forgive one another. But young people in special, because as I sit on death row, more young people came to death row simply because they got into it over a basketball game or whatever. Instead of just saying, I'm sorry and going on home, they went home and got a gun and came back and got their revenge that way. I just think this book teaches us that we need to check ourselves and we need to find deep in our soul why we are here and what our purpose is. And I just believe that if we was to think a little bit, all of us and some of us would never end up in prison because we don't think and because we don't teach forgiveness. I wanted to show people regardless of what one does in life, they still got children and we all deserve to be treated in such a manner. And I would just love for young people to stop thinking 
reacting first and think last. Once they get to death row, it's too late. Thank you for your question. You're very welcome. Uh, hello. Uh, this is actually my second time seeing you. I saw you last summer in Equal Justice Initiative, and it's great to see you again. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering, as a high school student or someone who's becoming kind of an adult soon, <laughs> what? Shut up. <laughs> uh, what is the best way to help fight this issue and get involved, or do you know of? Well, I'm gonna call my dearest friend up here. And she's a lawyer, and tell you the best way that uh, you can help out with them. Say. Do your homework, uh, as I probably told you last year. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first, I, I my name is Sia. I'm an attorney at EJI. I worked on Mr. Hinton's case, and it just um, gives all of us here from EJI the most tremendous pride to have anything to do with this remarkable man. So um, thank you for the question. I think there are so many things um, going on in terms of initiatives to challenge the criminal justice system to be more just and more fair. And I think you can go to EJI.org and find many examples of things. But I think for folks who are interested in um, working to end the death penalty, there's a variety of initiatives in many states on that. We have projects going on to end the investment in private prisons and, and the incredible um, array of businesses that have sprung up beyond the prisons themselves that are invested in the status quo and, and having more prisons and more incarceration. Um, and I think there's a, there's a whole range of things related to reentry. Uh, Mr. Hinton hasn't talked as much about his experience coming out of prison after 30 years, but he has faced tremendous challenges with great um, skills and gifts, and um, not everybody has that, and even still, it's, it's a tremendous challenge. So there's a variety of organizations doing reentry work, including us, which you can support, and maybe, Mr. H, you want to say a little bit about the process coming from Holman to the, to the free world. It was devastating. The thing that got me more than anything is modern technology. Uh, uh, I often tell this story that, a true story. The day that I released my best friend for 58 years asked me, where did I want to go? The first place. And I think he thought I was going to say, let's go to McDonald's somewhere. But I didn't. I said, I wanted to go see where they laid my mother's body. And he said, okay, buck up. And I put the seatbelt on and I thought he was just trying to find a radio station and actually he was putting a GPS in. And as we go down the road, a white lady come on and say, in one tenth of a mile, turn right. <laughs> and I said, what the hell? <laughs> and I'm serious, I was afraid and I kept thinking in my mind that this have I all been a setup. I was going back to death row and I kept wondering, how did they get my best friend to, to get in on this act? And, and I was scared to look back there because I knew then but two people get in that car and I'm wondering, how did this white lady get in this car? <laughs> but more important, what's she doing in this car? And I'm trying to look at him and he laughing and I'm pointing and I'm saying, And finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He pulled over, uh, and he said, that's not a white lady. That's just a voice of a white lady. This is the GPS tracked in. Anywhere you want to go, all you got to do is put in the address, and she'll tell you how to go. And still not understanding what GPS means, I said, well, how did she get in there? And, <laughs> and modern technology have passed me by, and they uh, he gave me a phone when I first came home, and I looked at it and said, what is this? And they said, it's a telephone. And I still haven't been able to catch up with it. Uh, it takes pictures, it email, it texts. And I often ask young people, for us older generation, why do y'all text anybody? 
when you can just call that person and talk to them. And I think that is one of the things I miss more that we don't talk to each other. We text, and I, I tend to uh, don't text back. I haven't learned how my brother here call me, and if somebody else on the line, if I tell him to hold up, well, he can get ready. I'm more than like I'm going to hang up because I don't know how to go back <laughs> and get him. But modern technology has exceeded anything that I thought I would come home and experience. Uh, and you just keep hearing this and that, and in prison, uh, you're not expected to come back out. And so, to me, as I have been three years of just pure learning how to do a lot of things with the telephone, uh, as well as infrastructure have been something different. And now, a Walmart is the store that everybody go to and, and shop one place, shop and store. So, uh, to come back in a world that I know nothing about is sometimes challenging and even they got these remote, they got all these knobs on it, and I just go to one channel and I ride it out. Uh, <laughs> so I, am, I don't have the time for that, so that's part of who I am. Yes, sir. Uh, th thank you for your talk. And thank you. <coughs> all, all, <clears throat> all honor for your achievement. Uh, <clears throat> there seems to be a kind of sickness in the land. Uh, you're, you're, your terrible example is not unique. Uh, all over the country, and I know a particular case in Maryland, and I'm sure there are many others, where the goal of the police, the detectives, and the prosecution is to get somebody, whether it's the person who actually uh, perpetrated the crime or not. It's, to, it's like almost like if, as if it were a football game. We're going to be the winners. Right. Uh, is there anything? Do you see any way we could start curing this illness? Because it's a terrible thing. It's just, uh, it, it sullies our country. You well, know, I, we're not Russia, but uh, it, it doesn't make us the United States we should be. Well, you know, I often say that if we sit here and do nothing, then they continue to do whatever they want to do. How we vote is so important. I have never voted, and, and I do want to say that I did get my voting right back since I've been home. And, uh, I refuse to vote on racist line. I refuse to vote on gender line. I do my homework. I read and study and find out as much as I can about a candidate, and if that candidate don't fit what I look for, I don't care if he's my brother. He won't get my vote. And I think that's the problem that we have seen on America, and we believe the politicians have told us, once you put me in office, let me do it. And we have sit back and allowed them to do whatever they want, and there's no consequence behind it. Uh, just in my case, the state of Alabama refused to give me any compensation. The prosecution knew that. He was lying. He knew that those bullets didn't match. But the United States Supreme Court have given them a blank check. So prosecutor can do whatever they want to, and there's no repercussion behind it. But as a defense attorney, if you get up there and tell a lie, they will charge you with perjury. I think the same law should apply to the prosecution. If they get up there and lie willingly, why shouldn't they be held accountable? And we as a human being, we as citizens, we just sit back and let them do what they want to, and this is the result. That's why police does what they want to do. And I often say this. I use this that the death penalty is at an epidemic. For those who follow the news, and there was a time, drugs. When the drug was over in this neighborhood, no one gave a damn. But the moment the drugs came over in this neighborhood, all of a sudden it's an epidemic. And I think that death penalty is at an epidemic. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, in the South, I can't speak for nowhere else, there are some white men on death row. So I don't want you to sit here tonight and think you're immune and you're exempt in the South. They will put you on death row in a heartbeat. But I just think that we all just sit around and we talk for a moment and we don't take the discussion no further. And come election time, we listen at one second sound bite and that's who we go to the poll and vote for. And those are the very people that it's not in there for our best interest. It does none of us good for innocent men and women to go to prison. 
It does none of us good when police have the authority to just shoot you and nothing is done about it. We need to step our game up and we need to make sure that this stops before we all find ourselves in a war that we don't want to be in. May I ask a question here? I believe everything you say. Therefore, I don't have $10, but I have $5. I'm going to send it your way, and you deposit it for some charitable purpose. I, will. I want to understand. I teach criminal law. I need to know what I learned from what I hear from you, that I should tell them. This is no laughing matter to me. I'm delighted your sense of humor survived that experience. But it's shocking me. I have spent 50 years teaching criminal law. When I hear that kind of a story, it's shocking. One thing I would like to understand, what was it that those two detectives, who was it that gave them your name? How did it start? What did you do to earn that first stop? Because what happened clearly is there was some corruption initially, and the rest just continued. I want to stop that co corruption in the first place. Let me, let me say this to the audience. I use sense of humor because of the sadness it caused in my heart. If I didn't, I would never be able to tell my story. But in the South, the South is still mad because they lost the Civil War. You can be angry, and that's what we need people to be angry. But in the South, that angry serve no purpose. I know we'll forget. After we did an extensive background check on these particular police officers, they had already been tried for using a caliper on black men genitals to get confession. Instead of being fired and found guilty, they was moved out to the suburbs where all whites live and those white found them not guilty. And then they promoted them. See, one thing we need to stop in this country, we, when a police officer does something, we need to stop putting them out in the suburb. Let him be tried right in the county or wherever in the city. But these same police officers, had been tried not once but twice, and they was found not guilty by an all-white jury. And as long as we have this racism in this world, we're going to have these problems. And believe me, it was only laughter that was able to get me through because if I sit here and told you the truth, I don't never tell you that I thought about hanging myself because I didn't see no end. It was through laughter that I had to somehow overcome the injustice that they had done to me. And then when you have the police, you have the judge and you have the prosecutor. That's why I made the statement, we got to learn who we vote for and how we vote. That's how you stop it. But in the South, I don't know can it be stopped unless we start protesting, and I'm not talking about protesting burning down buildings. I'm talking about protesting in the vote machine. Just as they put uh, Jones in office in Alabama, back, that's how you stop it. But I wish I had a real answer for you that perhaps could satisfy you. But this goes on not just in Alabama, but every state in the United States. And let's be real. We hear it so much on the news till we become numb to it. We don't even think about it. But I'm here to tell you, innocent men and women goes to prison and death row every day in this country and the innocent men and women are executed every day in your name. The government kills in your name every day. And after tonight, what are we going to do? That's where we go to the polls and that's where we send our strongest message that we are not going to tolerate any more of this injustice. We're going to stop it and that's how you do it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your story, and you do have a story to tell, and I believe that
that you have found your purpose, your calling. This is your ministry. There's definitely no doubt about that. Would you have the EJI people raise their hands? I think we should know who they are, all of them back there in the back, and for their EJI. for their work. Well, yeah. Oh no, that's wonderful. Look. I ha I have been to Alabama in August. Oh. And it was the hottest place <laughs> I've ever been. You know, I would never want to go to hell if it's going to be that hot. But, you know, but be that as it may, right here today, uh, what is it that you would have us do to help you uh, in, in uh, this? It really is, is, is a crusade in what you're trying to do. I know help EJI, but what would you in your heart of hearts well, want us to do? If it was not for EJI, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here. Uh, EJI is a nonprofit organization that monitors death row inmates as well as juveniles being sentenced to at the age of 16 to 160 years or 200 years, and the work they do is un unbelievable. And too often, we live in a society that really and honestly don't give a damn. As long as no one in my family have been touched by it yet, everything is good. And I just think we as a society need to put our voting in, in practice. To me, that is the most biggest thing we can do. Stop putting people because you like what they said. That's just politicians know how to get to you. But in, in my case, I don't know do you have it in Washington. Men and women that comes out of prison need to feel wanted because if they don't feel wanted as she said we have a re-entry program try to teach them and try to get them ready for society we tend to throw the least away and those are the ones that need us more than ever and i just think people that at eji that believe in me they can't take every case they have or uh, come across but we need a system where innocent people don't ever go to jail in the first place and we need to be outraged. I don't care if you live in Washington, you should be outraged for what happened to me in Alabama. And if, if it happened to someone in Kentucky or wherever, we all should be outraged about it. And until we, this rage is put in the right perspective, it's gonna continue to happen over and over and over again. Uh, I normally try to kill a lawyer with me everywhere I go. This is just happening you live in Washington. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, often I, I live by myself and, I think every day, mm -hmm. or they gonna kick the door down and say I did something. Uh, when I'm in the car, I ask myself, are they gonna plant a gun on me and say I had a gun? Everybody looks at me and they think I'm free, but I'm not free. Every day I go on death row, and every day I see a policeman, mm -hmm. I think oh, he gonna get behind mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And it's just the day that I'm going back mm -hmm. to jail. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know will I ever be free, but I pray to God that I will be free one day. It's just a shame that I have to live in the state of mind that I'm living. And I just want you to know that I appreciate all of you coming, but we got to take this rage to the violent box, and we got to start voting. That's the only way I think we can cure uh, what's ailing this country. But thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. And technology has passed me by, too, so don't feel badly, okay? Right. <laughs> 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 